So I'd like to welcome all of you today, um, Friday, May 12th, to the Center for Healthy Sex monthly Sexpert webinar series. Today, I'm delighted to introduce Gabe Deem to you, who's going to talk to you about internet pornography. Gabe Deem is an activist for better sex education and public speaker. After recovering from an addiction and porn-induced sexual dysfunction himself, he has spent years studying the science of addiction and now runs RebootNation.org, a free online community to help addicts and their partners overcome problems related to porn use. With a passion for helping others and raising awareness, Gabe now speaks internationally and has shared his story with Time Magazine, Katie Couric, Chelsea Handler, MTV, many others, and now with you. So it's my good pleasure to turn you over to the interesting and exciting mind of Gabe Dean. Thank you. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm excited and uh, thankful for this opportunity to uh, share with you guys uh, a little bit of my story, um, a little bit of the knowledge that I've gained over the last six years being plugged into the recovery community from uh, pornography addiction. Um, and a few things before I get started that I just want to say uh, for clarification of what this talk specifically going to be about. Um, it's not going to be about masturbation. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about pornography, sex, and addiction, uh, a lot of skeptics and naysayers like to say that our focus is really on masturbation, but it's not. It's going to be specifically focused on the effects of high-speed Internet porn and um, what can uh, happen from growing up consuming chronically uh, porn. So it's going to be focused on that. It's also not going to be focused on sex addiction. Um, I like to differentiate uh, sex addiction from porn addiction. Now, I know there's some instances where those can be uh, mingled together, but this talk specifically going to be on porn addiction. Um, for example, if you take a young teenage guy that grew up watching Internet porn, um, if he grew up playing Madden NFL on Xbox, which is a football video game, he wouldn't necessarily be addicted to playing football. Um, for example, if playing the video game is all he's ever done, he may not be able to throw or catch a ball in real life. In the same way, uh, a young man who grew up watching Internet porn may be a virgin. He may have never had sexual experience. Um, and he may not, as you'll see, and I'll uh, cover more deeply, be able to be intimate with a real partner. Um, so I want to make that differentiation. This is uh, going to be primarily focused on porn addiction. Um, and I will take questions towards the end of the talk. So as I'm covering my slides and going through my story, if you have anything that pops into your head that you'd like to ask me, um, I'd be more than happy to dive uh, further into that. So uh, I'm open book and feel free to ask me anything um, and I'll let y'all know when that is going to happen. Um, so let's get into it. Today I wanna answer a few important questions and one being, uh, what are the effects of internet porn? Um, specifically, what is porn doing to uh, children and young people who grow up using internet porn all through their adolescence? Um, in 2011, a real popular TED Talk by Philip Zimbardo pointed out two things. First, he pointed out that a growing number of young men are flaking out uh, in school. They're losing their motivation to uh, achieve their goals and be successful in life. They're kind of hitting a period where they just, they just want to chill and they have very little motivation. Um, he noticed that this was a growing trend. He also noticed that guys were uh, flaking out or wiping out sexually with women, in his words, uh, meaning that they were getting to a point where it was becoming more difficult or impossible for them to be uh, aroused in an intimate situation or um, be able to be aroused to have sex with a real-life partner. Um, but he wasn't the first to uh, suggest this. In 2007, uh, psychiatrist Norman Doidge published his uh, New York Times bestselling book. It's a great book. I highly encourage everyone to check it out. It's called The Brain That Changes Itself. Um, and in it, in Chapter 4, he dedicated an entire chapter to sexuality um, and also focused on the effects of porn. And he noticed a, uh, a phenomenon that was happening. He said during the mid to late 1990s, when the internet was growing rapidly and pornography was exploding on it, I treated or assessed a number of men who all had essentially the same story. 
they reported increasing difficulty of being turned on by their actual partner, spouses, or girlfriends, though they still considered them objectively attractive. Now, I know what Norman Doidge and Philip Zimbardo was saying is a real thing because it happened to me. Um, so I want to take a few moments to share with you a little bit of my background and a little bit of my story. So I'm 29 years, uh, years old now, and I grew up as part of the first generation that had unlimited access to uh, Internet porn. We could watch whatever we wanted, whenever we wanted, for as long as we wanted, and we could do this all anonymously, and we could do it for free. And not only did we have such easy access to unlimited sexual stimuli, we lacked education on its potential negative effects. We had no clue that porn could have a potential physiological um, or psychological negative effect. Uh, we were told by a lot of mainstream media and a lot of um, sexperts or sexologists, if you will, that uh, porn would be sex positive and that it might help, um, I'm sure as everyone listening has heard at some point or another, it might help spice up the bedroom. Um, unfortunately for my situation, and uh, you'll soon see thousands and thousands of other guys, that turned out not to be true. Our, our porn use did leave, uh, lead to negative effects. Um, a few things to point out about my story uh, that are important is I was raised in a very loving, supportive environment. I was lucky enough to uh, never have experienced any abuse or trauma as a kid. And uh, there was no history of addiction in my family. Um, now, I was uh, first exposed to porn at the age of eight. I found a Playboy or Hustler magazine while I was playing hide-and-go-seek in the neighborhood with some friends. And uh, I knew what masturbation was. So around the age of eight, I started uh, masturbating to pornographic images. Um, and then around the age of 10, if we fast forward a couple years, uh, my family got cable TV, and uh, I would stay up late at night while my parents thought I was sleeping. Um, you know, they'd come in and check on me, and I'd pretend like I was sleeping. And once they went to bed, I'd get up and watch uh, HBO and uh, other cable channels with softcore porn. And I'd watch MTV and BET uh, booty shaking videos, things like that. Uh, teenage guy stuff that I uh, probably should have been sleeping and helping my brain uh, grow and develop, but I wasn't. Um, but things really took off uh, in a bad way around the age of 12. And that's when my family got high-speed Internet. So as soon as this happened, I'd ride my bike home from school and watch Internet porn for a couple hours sometimes before my parents got home. Kids at school, would uh, we would exchange pieces of paper with tips and tricks of where we could watch uh, free porn, uh, give each other advice on how we could uh, clear our history, and delete our cookies and tips like, you know, one example would be stopping a download right before it was at like 98% so it wouldn't save on your computer and stuff like that. Uh, we were very tech savvy and uh, we knew how to hide it. But, um, uh, and when this was a normal part of teen culture, there was times uh, going into high school where my friends and I actually uh, would watch porn together in class. I remember I remember on one instance where I had uh, porn videos on my PlayStation Portable, which is like a Game Boy. And if you don't know what a Game Boy is, I can't help you. It's just a gaming device. Um, but uh, just to paint you the picture of how prevalent it was and how, um, most importantly, how unashamed my friends and I specifically were around our porn use. We were very open around it. Um, that's why I'm telling you uh, how open we are with our porn use because a lot of uh, – Skeptics of porn causing problems will say that the only reason porn leads to problems is shame. Um, and nowadays that's just simply not always true because as you have young kids with developing brains, um, and we'll get into that more in a little bit, they're chronically consuming a supernormal stimulus. It can have a negative impact on their brain regardless if issues are present or not. Um, now, the negative effects that happened in my life, I didn't notice until much further down the line. Um, I became sexually active at the age of 14. And that's when the battle for pixels on a screen and the battle for real life sexual partners began for me. And over time, going through high school and into college, I remained sexually active and I continued watching internet porn. 
And eventually, Pixels on a Screen won that war. It won my brain's uh, desire and motivation and ability to be aroused. Ultimately, leading to a time when I was 23 years old, I went to have um, sex with a beautiful girl who I was extremely attracted to, I liked a lot, and when we went to have sex, nothing happened. I couldn't feel any arousal, and it, it just felt like a complete, um, I like to say like asexual or alien experience where my body didn't feel anything and it didn't really um, connect with the situation. I didn't feel any connection with, uh, with the girl. And it was weird to me because I had sexual experience before, so I knew something was wrong. So I did what anyone would do. And I got on Google and I started searching for answers. And uh, what I found completely blew my mind. I found forums with hundreds and thousands of guys my age. Uh, I was 23 at the time. Um, and some were younger than me in their teenage years. Some were in their 30s, 40s, all ages, all backgrounds that all had essentially the same problem that, um, as I began, Norman Doidge and Philip Zimbardo were pointing out. We had chronically used Internet porn for several years and ultimately reached a point where we either lost our desire for real partnered sex or we lost our ability to be aroused with uh, real partnered sex. And um, as soon as I realized porn had a negative effect on me. Long story short, I quit. And quitting wasn't easy. But as I was going through recovery, um, and I'll give my advice for those in recovery if we have anyone listening uh, towards the end. Um, but as I was going through recovery, I got as educated as I could on the topic of porn addiction, of neuroplasticity, and sexual conditioning, and how what we experience can alter and shape the arousal template in our brain. But I was also staying really plugged in to the conversation around porn and how it's impacting youth, how it's impacting society and culture, and uh, just the, the whole entire topic of porn addiction. I was staying really plugged into what the debate was, what, was the conversa what were the conversations that were happening. Um, and I noticed a lot of misconceptions floating around. And I want to cover a couple of those real popular misconceptions that – that seemed to me to be a lot of historical, maybe outdated arguments that no longer applied to the young generation uh, that I was in that uh, sometimes are referred to as digital natives, where we were born into a world with Internet and access to Internet porn. So let's go over a couple of those popular misconceptions. Now, the first misconception is what I like to call just the issues misconception, and I kind of touched on this earlier, where um, young boys today – uh, like myself and my peer of friends, uh, we were all very outgoing. Uh, we all had real-life partners through our teenage years, through our adolescence, um, and we didn't have any shame around our porn use. We were told porn would be sex positive. We were told porn would increase our sex lives um, and give us you know, more knowledge in the bedroom and things like that. Um, and we didn't always have issues that drove us to porn. Um, I didn't, like I said, I didn't have any abuse or trauma. I just had access and unlimited access at that, which in turn uh, ended up having a negative impact on me. And let's just talk about an adolescent brain for a second and a young, uh, a young male. He'll naturally find uh, pornography and sexual images arousing. Um, he has a developing, more malleable brain. So he is more vulnerable to um, addiction and addiction-related brain changes that can happen with chronic consumption, which we'll get into more later. And with Internet porn, there is unlimited novelty, another thing that amps up our brain's excitement and amps up the reward circuit in the brain. And the icing on the cake is we were completely aware of potential negative effects. The education on this is not in schools. The education on this was not known about in the 90s or early 2000s. Um, so those are some things to point out, that chronic consumption can lead to problems regardless of issues being present or not. Now, I'm not uh, making a blanket statement saying that uh, addicts um, never have issues that lead to addiction. We all know that that's not always true. There's a lot of underlying um, issues and causes that can lead to problems. But I just want to say that it's not always the case. Sometimes chronic consumption through adolescence can lead to negative effects, specifically when we're talking about porn. Another misconception I want to talk about is attractiveness. And um, this is for the people who think uh, if you have, let's say, erectile dysfunction or you have a porn addiction and you're in a relationship, 
um, that it's they put the blame on the partner. And for any partners that are listening or anyone that has, may have heard that, I just want to simply say the partner's not the problem. Uh, the brain is the problem and the conditioning that has taken place. Um, and from being plugged into a community, uh, Reboot Nation, my site, we have over 10,000 uh, mostly young guys who are going through recovery. And there's other forms with hundreds of thousands of guys. I've read countless stories where guys are filling their hearts and telling their stories, um, and most of them are anonymous, so there's no reason to uh, sugarcoat anything. They make it very clear that a lot of the times they're super attracted uh, to their partner, and attraction isn't the issue, um, and they find it very confusing. Um, and to partners that are listening, I want you to hear that because you're not the problem. And I want to say that most, most guys who uh, develop an addiction – things start changing. So when a guy first starts watching porn, let's say, it, let's take a teenage guy, for example. Yes, the original reason he might get into porn was because of he, was, he was searching for attractive actresses or anything like that, if you will. But over time, once um, desensitization takes place or the brain starts developing a tolerance, um, you seek and search things to give your brain a bigger neurochemical rush. And we'll get more into the science here briefly. But it, be, it, uh, it becomes less about looks of the actresses or actors um, or whatever the genre may be. It becomes less about looks and more about shock, anxiety, surprise, fetish, things that amp up the primitive part of the brain to give our brains a bigger neurochemical rush, which is why you'll see later that you can escalate into some pretty shocking stuff, and that's what happened to me as well. Another one I want to talk about is porn literacy. And this is a real popular misconception when we're talking about solutions to the problem of porn addiction. Um, a popular name that comes to mind is Cindy Gallup. She is the founder of MakeLoveNotPorn.com. And she markets it as uh, healthy sexuality. And one of her talking points is that we just need to teach young people specifically what healthy sexuality looks like. Um, so the solution isn't to stay away from porn, it's to show what healthy sex looks like, which is just uh, you know amateur porn or just real loving couples um, having sexual intercourse. The problem with that as a solution is the brain can wire up to whatever it is viewing regardless of the genre and it can lead to problems. So whether you're watching um, a, a loving couple um, have sexual intercourse and it's all consensual. Um, that doesn't matter. If you're watching, let's say, Marge and Homer Simpson have sex, uh, that can still develop problems where it's not even real people. So regardless of what you're watching, the brain can, through chronic consumption, develop addiction-related brain changes, wiring your brain for porn, which can um, inhibit your ability to be aroused with a real partner over time, and it can cause other brain changes that we'll get into. So genre doesn't matter. Now, as I said, this is a growing problem. What Norman Doidge and Philip Zimbardo were describing is now all over the uh, Internet and in therapist offices all over the world, where you have forums with tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of guys. Um, here's four popular ones on this slide. We have NoFap. Um, last time I checked, it has over well over 200,000 members, and that's people that actually signed up and made an account. Um, my site has more than 10,000. That's Reboot Nation. Uh, there's another popular one, Your Brain Rebalanced, and there's also another site on Reddit, uh, Porn Free, a subreddit on there with well over 20,000. And there's, for, there's forums that are non-English speaking that have hundreds of thousands, one in China with over a million guys. So this is a worldwide problem where there is Internet access at growing rates. And uh, research backs this up. This isn't just all anecdotal with no one looking into this. In the last couple years, lots of research has been pouring out. Um, this paper was from a U.S. Navy urologist and psychiatrist that was published last year. It looked at, uh, over time, um, increased rates of ED. It found that, it pointed out that 2002 and uh, prior, all studies assessing young male sexuality reported rates uh, around 2 to 5 percent. These are guys uh, around the age of 18 to 40. And studies assessing young male sexuality from 2010 and after all report rates around 30 percent. Now, I'm not going to say every single one of those cases is because of Internet porn, but you can see a clear correlation with increased access 
and a growing rate of young men who are struggling with uh, sexual dysfunction. Um, also, I want to point out in 2001-2002, uh, rates for older men, 40 to 80, were 13 percent in Europe, and another another study in Europe pointed out that after 2011, rates were higher in younger men than in older men, which is pretty crazy. Um, now let's answer the question, what are the effects that porn can have? Um, and let's go through some of the most popular ones that we see, some most common ones. We have anorgasmia and delayed ejaculation. Um, this can be a precursor to ED where it becomes extremely difficult, if not impossible, to climax with a partner. A real common uh, situation you see is uh, a guy may not be able to climax during sexual intercourse with a partner and he has to stop and maybe finish himself off with his hand or he has to fantasize about pornography just to reach climax. Um, so that's a, that can be a precursor to ED. Uh, maybe you don't have full-blown erectile dysfunction, but you could be well on your way if you are having to fantasize about porn just to stay erect or stay aroused. And then we have uh, porn-induced erectile dysfunction. This is what I experienced. Um, that's where you can get an erection with porn, but you can't without it. Now, this is uh, really important. Um, when I first found out that uh, porn could cause erectile dysfunction, I was very skeptical. I didn't, uh, I didn't know this was a thing. I didn't believe it was a thing. Um, but I saw a test that you can do, and that's to see if you can masturbate without porn. And to me, I, uh, I had access to porn since I was uh, 12 years old. I used porn every time I masturbated for over a decade. So I thought, oh, my gosh, what a novel idea. Maybe I'll try and masturbate without porn. I realized that I couldn't. I tried to uh, get an erection by myself um, on a nice, relaxing evening, and I realized that no matter what I uh, fantasized about or um, what I did to myself to not get too graphic, I, uh, I couldn't get an erection. But when I went back to porn and I turned on, uh, you know, some of my favorite porn, a compilation porn video, I instantly got an erection. So it was just like a light bulb moment, like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I'm dependent on porn for uh, an erection. And the, the reason this is so important is because what it rules out. If you can get an erection with porn, then that rules out an organic problem because simply turning on porn doesn't make organic problems go away. And on the uh, other hand of that, if you can't get an erection by yourself without porn, that rules out performance anxiety because, as I like to say, no one's uh, nervous about sexually satisfying their own hand because um, it's just you and your hand. And if you're a young, healthy guy, Historically speaking, you've been able to masturbate without the need of pixels on a screen. Humans have been doing that for ages. Um, so that's just a really important test. If you uh, aren't sure if porn could be behind some of these problems and symptoms, see if you are dependent on it or not, and that's a good place to start. And that uh, Navy paper that I just discussed a few slides back um, also suggests uh, medical uh, professionals to see if their patient can do that because there's a big gap and uh, doctors who went through uh, medical school decades ago, they didn't have to deal with uh, internet porn induced ED that's so popular today. So sometimes they just ask their young patient, can you masturbate? But the young guy assumes that he means with porn. So it's important to differentiate, can he masturbate without porn or not? Is he porn dependent? Is his erectile dysfunction only with a partner and not with porn? And um, in some cases, porn-induced ED can be so severe that you no longer can get it up with porn. Um, but that's the end of the road. And you can still recover from that, so there's hope, too. I'll get to that later. We have brain fog and concentration problems. Um, this is where nothing else seems interesting. Uh, it becomes difficulty to focus on anything other than stuff related to uh, pornography. Um, for example, uh, when I was in college, I could not focus on class. And I know that's, oh, that's normal for a young guy. But it was not just to where I was noticing young uh, females around me as a heterosexual male. It was very pornified. What I mean by that is uh, if I saw a girl, I didn't just think about being with her, I thought about porn scripts that I had seen. Uh, my thoughts became very pornified, just to put it simply. Um, and this is very common, uh, not only as a symptom, but also a withdrawal effect going through recovery. Um, increased social anxiety. 
Uh, this is very common. It becomes uh, increasingly uncomfortable in social situations. Uh, we see this with all forms of Internet addiction, whether that's social media, video gaming, or pornography. Um, I myself am normally a pretty uh, laid-back, chill dude, but in my depths of porn addiction, I became very socially awkward, very socially anxious, and it just wasn't my, uh, I guess, natural personality, if you will. Um, things became... Uh, a lot more anxious further on down the line. Um, you get a declining interest in real relationships. There's several studies that have pointed this out also. Um, this happens more subconsciously, meaning uh, you're not going to just tell, you, you know, if I talk to a young guy, no one ever admits verbally that, yeah, I'd rather masturbate to pornography than have sex with my attractive partner. Usually guys aren't aware of that. This happens more subconsciously where triggers or cravings drive you to pixels on a screen rather than drive you for intimacy or connection with a real partner. And we have escalating into more extreme material. This could be called tolerance. This could be called habituation. Um, and this is extremely common with the uh, with internet porn and the novelty that it provides. Put simply, what used to arouse you no longer does the trick. Um, a survey on popular forum NoFap that uh, I mentioned earlier has well over 200,000 guys. They asked about if their taste in porn uh, changed with continued use, and it found that 56% of them said yes. And they said that, in their own words, they escalated into deviant porn. Um, it's important to point out here that, yes, a lot of guys escalated, but a majority of those that escalated did not have shame around escalating. Again, a lot of skeptics of porn causing problems or skeptics of porn addiction even being a real thing will tell you that shame is the problem, not porn use and not its uh, physiological changes that can happen in the brain. This survey p refutes that completely. A lot of these guys on the forums have no shame. I myself did not have shame around my porn use. And again, I know I'm not speaking for everyone, but it's just important if we're arguing this topic or discussing this topic to point out that shame is not always the root cause. Um, negative effects can happen regardless of that. Now, Norman Deutsch kind of helps us um, understand how escalation uh, can occur in the brain. He says, the content of what patients found exciting changed as websites introduced themes and scripts that altered their brains without their awareness. Because plasticity is competitive, the brain maps for new exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them. This would be called sexual conditioning. Uh, and a study kind of demonstrated this in young heterosexuals, 16 to 18 year olds, when it asked about the motivations and experiences behind anal sex. So again, this is heterosexuals. The results found anal heterosex often appeared to be painful, risky, and coercive, particularly for women. Interviewees frequently cited pornography as the explanation for anal sex. Now, I want to point out a few very telling and, to me, heartbreaking quotes from the study. Uh, a young girl who was interviewed simply said, obviously people enjoy it if they do it. Now, the problem with that is from the results of this very study, we found that their motivations for doing it was pornography and the fact that they were seeing actors enjoying it, uh, portraying that it was normal or portraying that they were getting pleasure from it, that were their actors. So it's not what they innately desired and want. They're getting um, outside influence. And a young guy that was interviewed, uh, this quote right here has a very, um, very few or a couple important things to uh, to look at very closely. He says, I think that the boy enjoys it. I think it's the boy that pushes for it from watching porn and stuff. They want to try it. The girl is scared and thinks it's weird, and then they try it because the boyfriend wants them to. They normally don't enjoy it because they're scared, and I, I know that like with anal, if you're not, there should be a not right there. I messed up on my slide. If you're not willing, you don't relax. So there's a, couple in thing, there's a couple things in this quote that we could look at. One, young people are uh, manipulating and coercing their partners into doing, th into doing things they've seen from porn, not because they innately want to do it. And the girls are feeling pressure to do it. They're scared. They might not be willing in some instances, and there has to be some manipulation at some level or another just to get the, uh, the female to engage in the act. And 
I have to admit that some of the stuff that this guy is saying is something I would have said as a teenager too. Um, anal sex and other things that we were uh, regularly consuming in pornography were a normal part of our um, adolescent and young adult sex lives. And I can only see in retrospect that it was influenced by porn. We had no clue that porn was changing what we were into. Porn was having an influence on our relationships. We just thought it was normal, unfortunately. Um, now, a study of sexual conditioning kind of points how this can happen. They had, uh, a study had young virgin male rats mate with female rats sprayed with cadaverine. Now, this study is really cool to me because it's pretty telling. The young male rats, after mating with the female rats that were sprayed with cadaverine, which, by the way, is the smell of rotting flesh, so they sprayed the female rats with rotting flesh uh, perfume, if you will. After the rats mated together, the male rats, the newly conditioned rats, they were aroused by that smell. They chewed on and played with toys that were uh, laced with that smell. And normal unconditioned rats stayed far away or uh, ran in the corner and buried their heads in the corner. Um, so you can see it's sexual conditioning can be very pr uh, powerful. And what you wire with, if you will, what you experience during sexual arousal can alter the arousal template in your brain and can have pretty powerful effects. Um, for example, if young rats can be aroused by rotting flesh, uh, something drastic has uh, happened there because it's normal uh, to be repulsed and be aversive to it. Um, so do you even science? Uh, a lot of times people say there's no research that backs uh, any of what I'm talking about up. Uh, there are now 30-plus brain studies on porn users consistent with 200-plus Internet addiction brain studies um, that all support the addiction model at some level or another. Um, and I like to say that uh, with all those Internet addiction studies, the reason they're important, we know that if anything on the Internet can be addicting, like shopping for shoes or uh, gambling, if you will, or uh, social media, a lot of studies are showing that all these with um, – chronic consumption, chronic use over time can have um, addiction-related brain changes occur in the brain, then so can Internet porn. So even though we have 30-plus studies on porn use and uh, looking at the brain and um, evaluating what happens, there's also a lot of more research that back it up. And we also have 12 neuroscience-based reviews of their literature. Um, and if anyone wants a link to those, you can find them on yourbrainonporn.com. Uh, there's an article right in the middle of the homepage where you can find all that research, uh, and I'll give you more on that in a little bit. And we also have multiple case studies documenting recovery from ED and low libido by removing porn. And by case study, I mean they look at a uh, young man in this instance, and he has erectile dysfunction that can't be explained by any organic problems that they've looked at, and they have him remove porn and then he actually recovers from his sexual dysfunction by simply removing that single variable of porn use. Uh, they did this in the U.S. Navy study that I mentioned. Uh, they had young guys recover from dysfunctions by removing that. And there's also two other studies that have tracked recovery from sexual dysfunction by simply removing porn use. That's very important to know that that research is out there and that has actually taken place and documented in a peer-reviewed study. Now, uh, naysayer talking points, um, a lot of people say, well, porn isn't causing this increase in rates in ED. It's got to be uh, the fact that Viagra came out several years ago. And now that there's Viagra commercials, Cialis commercial, uh, commercials all over TV, now guys feel more comfortable uh, talking about it and going to their doctors. Um, the one problem with that, it's a big problem, is that the statistics and the rates are from anonymous uh, questionnaires. It's not men that are willing to publicly speak about this like myself. It's not men that are willing to go to the doctor and tell them, hey, I have erectile dysfunction. These are guys that are anonymously reporting it. Um, so that gives you a more accurate uh reading. And um, on the other side of that, it's, this one is funny to me because it contradicts them. They say uh, no shame, but then they say the problem is shame, as I've mentioned a couple times. So I feel like uh, naysayers or skeptics need to decide which way to go with that. Um, another thing they'll say that uh, they'll put the blame on that it's not porn is the refractory period. This is the period of time it takes a male to get another erection in between orgasms. Um, and 
this one's funny to me because it took me personally nine months to recover from porn-induced erectile dysfunction. A lot of guys recover sooner, uh, earlier than that. But uh, I don't know of any uh, literature or research that shows it takes nine months for a young, healthy male uh, to have another climax. Um, so that's clearly not the problem. It can take a very long time to recover from this. Uh, and then the last one is performance anxiety. Um, and again, the porn-induced ED test rules this out. These guys like myself who are developing this problem, we uh, eventually can't even masturbate without porn. So that rules out performance anxiety. Um, and a lot of the situations, these guys have been with their partners for years and then eventually can no longer be aroused. Um, so it's clearly not performance anxiety, especially when you look at the fact that we recover after removing porn use. Um, so what we have, uh, some people say it's a public health crisis. It's definitely a public health issue. Uh, for example, on these forums, um, if you, let me just say this to any listeners, if you find yourself in a dark place, if you find yourself uh, needing help, wanting help, uh, thinking that there's no hope, you're not alone. Um, this is a screenshot I took on uh, Your Brain Rebalance, which is one of those uh, recovery forums. I just typed in a word like suicide, and I got right here uh, 26 pages of results of young men contemplating killing themselves. So this is a serious issue. Um, there's a lot of people out there that are going through this that feel uh, just hopeless. Um, and if that's you, one, I want to say you're not alone, and two, that there's so much hope. Uh, this problem is an emotional problem, a mental problem, a physical problem, but you can recover. Uh, and we'll get into that uh, more in a little bit, but I myself went through this where I, uh, I went through a, a period of time where I was just super depressed, super sad. I felt like I wasn't ever going to recover. I felt like I would never have um, the ability to have sex again. So if that's you, know that you're not alone and know that there's so much hope. We, uh, The people that we followed, um, everyone has recovered that we followed um, and that has gotten back to us. Um, so let that give you hope. Um, and I just want everyone listening that's a therapist or a skeptic to know that regardless of what you think on the topic, this is a serious issue that needs more discussion. Um, and that's what we're doing, and that's why I'm glad that uh, the Center for Healthy Sex has given me this opportunity. So, again, we have success stories to, to change to a good note, a happy note, um, all over uh, accumulated from yourbrainonporn.com, these forums, uh, and we get, uh, we get letters from therapists, from uh, urologists that, uh, in the case studies that I mentioned where they document recovery from this. Um, and we have thousands and thousands of success stories where uh, people recover from uh, erectile dysfunction, from uh, maybe changing sexual tastes. After abstaining from pornography for a long period of time, uh, their brain, their arousal template reverts back to more innate tastes. So regardless of uh, the symptom that you may have, uh, from what we know, what we've seen, it is reversible, and there are all types of variations of stories that uh, point to success. Um, and the reason, now to kind of transition into some of the science, the reason uh, that success can happen, that recovery can happen, is uh, because of the brain's reward circuit and a word called neuroplasticity. This right here is a... Uh, uh, image of a simplified version of the reward circuit. You have the nucleus accumbens, the hypothalamus, and the uh, prefrontal cortex. Those all communicate together, and the, the VTA. And this slide right here also shows an uh, even more simplified version. Um, now, the reward circuit is the engine, if you will, that drives our mood, our emotions, our desires, um, it drives our motivation, our, uh, our desire for love and pair bonding and friendships. But it's also the place where we become addicted. And uh, the gas for this engine, the motivation, is a neurochemical called dopamine. This is a neurochemical that powers the reward circuit. Now, it used to be thought that dopamine equaled pleasure, but that's not necessarily true. Um, dopamine is more about seeking and searching and anticipation of a reward or achieving a goal. Um, it's, the, it's the signal that tells you I've got to have it, whatever it is, and what gets you to pursue it. Um, opio opioids are more linked with uh, pleasure. Um, now, if you block dopamine, research has shown that uh, you could take uh, – a dopamine blocker in the brain and give it to a rat 
and he will not eat. He will not pursue um, novel sexual mates. He'll just sit there. He'll have no motivation at all. Um, and we know from research that sexual arousal actually raises dopamine in the brain higher than other natural um, natural rewards like food, friendship, love, um, and uh, sexuality raises it higher. Now, another thing that raises dopamine in the brain is novelty. And what is a recipe for novelty? Well, the Internet, um, and in regards to sexuality, Internet porn. You have a uh, perfect novelty-producing machine with Internet porn. And a good point to point out right here is that, uh, historically speaking, some people say, well, um, porn's been around since the beginning of time. You know, uh, cavemen used to masturbate to pictures on the sides of mountains and cave drawings. Now, that's true, but we're talking about a uh, supernormal stimulus like internet porn that has an unlimited amount of uh, a limited amount of novelty. You can't shock and surprise yourself after looking at a cave drawing uh, one time because the novelty is gone. The same can be said for a uh, hustler or Playboy magazine. As soon as you're done flipping the pages, the novelty, the shock and surprise is gone, and you'd have to wait a month until the next issue came out. Um, same for VHS tapes. If you in the early 80s, 90s, if you went and got a VHS or even a DVD, the novelty wore off after that video, and you have to go back to the store and rent another one or download for seven hours uh, a, a movie. But in, around the uh, time YouTube was created, so that was 2005. That was when porn sites on the internet changed. So no longer did you have to wait for downloads. Uh, no longer could you only have a single window open. Um, no longer were you looking through magazines. Young people were watching internet porn where it was instantly available streaming. You could have multiple tabs open at the same time. And this is how pornography sites changed. So what we call tube sites um, where they mimic uh, YouTube's layout where you can have an unlimited amount of novelty to where you can see a thousand naked and willing partners in 10 minutes compared to what our ancestors could ever access. It's not even... It's not even a comparison. And around that same time, uh, YouTube happened in 2005. Two years after that, uh, around 2007, 2008, was when you had an explosion of young people showing up on forums all over the Internet with problems. So, again, more access, chronic consumption, increase in young people reporting problems. Now, the uh, Coolidge effect is a term that describes the automatic uh, response in the body to uh, novel potential mates. This Australian study did just that. It showed the same porn clip to subjects, uh, I believe it was 18 times, and on the 19th time, you can see on this graph, their arousal, their attention, and um, their erections sprang to attention uh, on the 19th uh, clip, and that's when they showed them a new porn scene. So novelty got their attention, spiked their arousal, spiked their, uh, spiked their uh, attention. Um, and here's a quote from a guy. I very rarely even watched a whole porn scene and can't remember when I saw an entire movie. Too boring. I always wanted new stuff. I can relate to this quote. Um, some of my sessions, if you will, I would click and click and search for the perfect scene uh, to finish to. Um, I was in search of novelty. I was in search of a neurochemical rush. Um, I eventually didn't care who the actresses were or what was going on. I was searching for that shock. Um, and this is, uh, internet porn can be described of as a supernormal stimulus. I know y'all have heard me use that word a couple times. And that is an exaggerated version of a normal stimulus that amplifies uh, what we find especially compelling or arousing. Um, for instance, uh, Nicholas Timbergen, he was a researcher that uh, looked into supernormal stimulus, and he coined the term. He, had, uh, he found that birds would uh, tend to larger fake eggs, more colorful eggs, and they would neglect their real eggs. They could be tricked into taking care of larger, faker eggs. And uh, another time he had beetles uh, mate with big uh, beer bottles that resembled in their uh, reward circuit in their brain, they thought, oh my gosh, this was a uh, big female that would produce better offspring for survival. So their brains were tricked into thinking that that was better to pass on their genes was to mate with a bottle. Um, how is this any different 
than a young male who spends all his sexuality and wires his brain to pixels on a screen. Uh, that picture is actually from the movie Don John. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone in recovery, but it's interesting. It came out several years back. Uh, he actually, in that movie, gave up, uh, ends up, spoiler alert, he gives up porn because he can't masturbate without it. Um, the movie just really briefly touched on that, but I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, here's a quote from a researcher, young people averse to sex. Uh, they said, today's internet-oriented society has had a particularly bad effect on young people in this regard. Uh, there was a study in 2011 from Japan that found 16 to 19-year-olds, almost 40% of them were disinterested in the real thing. They were disinterested in real-life sex. Uh, the researchers pointed out that they were in love with their avatar or cartoon girlfriends. So that is pretty telling when such a high percentage of young people are disinterested in sex. Now, these behaviors all elevate dopamine, endless sexual novelty, violation of expectations, searching, seeking, anticipation of what's next, shock and surprise, and anxiety. These are all what make Internet porn a supernormal stimulus. The fact that you can click to whatever you want and always violate your expectations. You can seek and seek and seek. While you're watching one video, you can search for more. There's always an anticipation of what you'll find in a search or the next click, and you can shock and surprise yourself greater than any time in human history. And some of the stuff that you can watch can create anxiety or fear, which can elevate the neurochemical rush in your brain and increase arousal. A quote from John Mayer about this novelty, uh, this is a, from an interview he did with Playboy several years back. He said, you're looking for the one out of 100 you swear is going to be the one you finish to, and you still don't finish. He goes on to say, you continue to make yourself later for work. Uh, in a sad way, I find that funny because I can relate to that. There's times where my search for novelty ate up hours and hours of my day. My addicted brain was craving novelty. Um, so I have a question that I will answer. What are the possible consequences of all this dopamine in response to one type of stimulus? Um, I, want to, uh, I want to point out that this answers the question of um, can addiction occur? This answers the question of how much is too much? A lot of people ask that. How much, well, how much is too much? The answer is whenever sexual conditioning takes place, and the answer is whenever addiction-related brain changes take place. So there's no, oh, well, after four hours you're going to have problems. That's not the answer. Everyone's going to be different, and it's when the brain starts to uh, change physiologically and addiction-related brain changes occur. So I want to dive into this and cover some of those brain changes. Uh, we have sensitization, which is a hyper-reactivity to addiction cues, a super memory of pleasure, if you will, and this leads to cravings. Uh, we have desensitization, a numbed pleasure response. This could be described as tolerance or uh, habituation, getting bored. Um, and we have hypofrontality, a weakened impulse control, inhibited frontal lobes. Um, pre our, our prefrontal cortex uh, communicates with our reward circuit, and uh, studies have pointed out that the communication and circuits that communicate and make decisions gets impaired uh, with more porn use, um, and that's called hypofrontality, basically poor decisions. And then we have altered stress response. Minor stress leads to cravings and relapse, and I'm going to dig into these a little bit more in depth. Um, sensitization uh, can be described of like I said, as a super memory of pleasure or Pavlovian conditioning. So I don't know if y'all have heard of Pavlov's dog. It's a real popular uh, example. Pavlov's dog was trained to salivate with a bell. So you had food and you had a bell, and every time he rang the bell, he knew that it was time for food, and he began to salivate. Even when there's no food, if you just rang the bell, his brain remembered that bell equals food, and so he would salivate. And then eventually they took the bell away, um, or they took the food away and then kept ringing the bell, and eventually the brain unwired and it no longer salivated. So a learned behavior both ways, wiring to the bell, unwiring from the bell. Um, and looking further into it, if we want to uh, picture the brain's reward circuit, the yellow line right here would be the uh, neurocircuitry, the neural pathway for porn. 
Um, and this will wire up any sights, any sounds, any smells, any sensations, emotions, memories that are associated with porn use. That pathway and those things associated with porn use will um, become stronger over time. Um, and sensitization can be summed up as the old but true saying, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. Right here we have an image of uh, neurons at the top. And then if you look at the bottom picture, the connections, the neurons that connect at the synapse, which I'll show a little more closely here in a second, uh, the connections increase over time. So what that translates to is a stronger signal. Um, here's a quote from a young guy uh, that kind of describes sensitization. I relapsed to porn once, and even though I didn't get fully erect, I could not believe the intensity of the rush I got when I clicked to the site. Very powerful excitation, tingling, dry mouth, and even trembling. Now, again, he points out that he could not get fully erect. In some severe cases, that can happen. You can be super uh, sensitized for something, but the desensitization can be so severe that it no longer can arouse you. Um, a University of Cambridge study pointed out that the uh, compulsive porn users, they wanted porn more, but they didn't necessarily like it. And this is a classic marker of addiction. They never were really satisfied. So to picture it, um, sensitization in your brain, think of pathways. Think of water that flows through the pathway of least resistance or walking on a really grassy area. Over time, you form a rut in your brain. You, f you form a preferred pathway to a reward or pleasure. Um, so to go back to our imagery, we have pathways for real people. That would be in this slide, that would be the white arrow. And then we have pathway for porn, uh, which would be the yellow. And over time, if you use porn, you see the uh, yellow arrow got bigger. It got stronger. And the real people arrow got weaker. So this is where porn-induced ED would take place. Your, uh, your arousal template is wired for pixels on a screen and everything associated with your porn use. And the signal for real intimacy with a real person becomes weaker. Um, your brain craves pixels on a screen. Um, a, a study, that same Cambridge study, found that 60% of those compulsive porn users uh, had porn-induced ED or low libido. Now, it's important to point out that it wasn't organic. Their, uh, their penises still functioned with porn use. And over time, if you quit viewing porn, if you abstain, or a term we call rebooting, rebooting your brain or rewiring, the pathway for real people can strengthen and become stronger, and eventually you can achieve intimacy and have real sexual intercourse. This happens because of a term called neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to change and to adapt as a result of new experience. Um, like Pavlov's dog wiring the bell to food, everything that we do, every behavior we engage with changes our brain at some level or another. You create new pathways, and if you abstain from something, you weaken neurological pathways. And this is uh, magnified in an adolescent brain. An adolescent brain is at its peak dopamine production. It's at its peak um, everything neurochemically production. Neurogenesis is exploding. New neurons are exploding. The teenage brain is wiring up to everything it experiences so that when it reaches adulthood, it'll pursue healthy, uh, successful things, things that will help uh, a, a young human carry on your genes, things that will help you, uh, a young human be successful. And at the other side of that, um, it's developing what to avoid, to avoid pain. Pursue pleasure, pursue goals, pursue success, and um, uh, reproduction and avoid pain. And that's magnified in the adolescent brain. Now I want to dig into uh, desensitization. Um, this right here is a picture of neurons communicating right in the middle where you have the balls and the uh, it looks like a person doing the YMCA sign with their hands wide open. I want you to picture the, the receptors on the right, the little hands with their arms open, as um, ears. And uh, think about when someone screams at you or you hear a gunshot, you cover your ears. That's what happens with addiction at a real simplified level. The uh, sending neuron on the left is sending dopamine to the receiving neuron on the right. And if that signal is uh, chronic over time, it's too loud, the receiving neuron will reduce the number of receptors 
uh, to hear the message. And any number um, of receptor reduction, if dopamine's reduced, those both translate to a weaker signal, which results in desensitization um, or tolerance. Uh, a study points this out from the Max Planck Institute. Uh, it found that correlated, or it correlated porn use with changes in brain structures and brain response to sexual images. Um, higher hours per week, more years of porn viewing, correlated with a, a reduction in reward circuitry gray matter. This was a graph from the study showing increased porn use, uh, changes in brain structure, structure and gray matter. Uh, lead author Simone Kuhn said that could mean that regular consumption of pornography more or less wears out your reward system. Um, and porn users' tolerance often manifests as escalating to new genres, as I discussed. That could be shock, surprise, anxiety. All of those amp up the reward circuit. Um, another brain change, I'm going to start moving a little quickly because I'm uh, running out of time and I'd like to take some questions. Um, alterations in prefrontal cortex functioning and connections between the reward circuit and the frontal lobe lead to reduced impulse control, yet greater, greater cravings to use. So cravings to use, poor decisions, a marker of addiction. Um, a quote from the Max Planck study found that dysfunction of the circuitry has been related to inappropriate behavior choices such as drug seeking, regardless of the potential negative outcome. Nerve connections between the reward circuit and prefrontal cortex worsened with increased porn watching. Again, that's what the study found. It found evidence of hypofrontality the more porn that was used. Um, and lastly, I'm not going to dig too much into this, but uh, the stress system in us gets altered. Uh, our response to stress gets altered, which can lead to uh, cravings and also explains withdrawal from addiction. Uh, it activates uh, stress systems that cause a lot of the symptoms that uh, people recovering can feel. To sum up, desensitization, if it could talk, it would say, I can't get no satisfaction. Sensitization would be saying, hey, I've got just what you need. Hypofrontality would be saying, bad idea, but I can't stop you. And altered stress circuits would say, I need something now to take the edge off. This is the addicted brain. Um, advice I would give, uh, get educated. Uh, a great place to do that is yourbrainonporn.com. Um, one thing I did during my recovery, the most important thing I did was get educated. Uh, learning the science I just presented you briefly uh, at a neurological level really helped me to see what my porn use had done to me and what would continue to happen to me if I continued using. And I also understood it at a neurological level how to recover. Uh, stop reinforcing those neurological pathways. Um, I changed my environment, which is always good. I replaced my porn viewing with uh, spending more time with real people, going to the gym, uh, picking up basketball, and other things that I kind of neglected once I developed the addiction. And then I, I learned about withdrawal, so I knew what would be uh, what to prepare for. And then I got support, whether that's professionally or online form. I encourage everyone to do both. Uh, any support you can get is good. Know that you're not alone. And then change how you view porn. I don't mean start watching porn while you're standing up or wearing sunglasses. I mean view porn uh, not – this is just my advice. Uh, don't view it as a moral or unmoral thing. View it as a healthy or unhealthy thing. Uh, for me, I just viewed porn as I would view, for example, cigarettes. Uh, yeah, they might be fun, they might give me a buzz, um, but eventually they lead to long-term negative effects, and that's how I changed my view of porn, just to something that was against my pleasure and against my uh, ability to be uh, intimate with the real partner. So at this time, I would like to uh, take any questions. Um, while we're getting ready to do that, I want to point everyone to this study right here, Is Internet Pornography Causing Sexual Dysfunctions? A Review with Clinical Reports. This is the uh, paper that featured U.S. Navy urologists and psychiatrists Lots of good info in there, lots of links to uh, studies that cover everything I'm talking about. Um, you can reach uh, – I'll skip that for now. Um, that is – All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star 6. Okay, you can ask questions now, it sounds. You can contact me uh, on Twitter. You can find some videos on Reboot Nation. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, this is Charlie from Center for Healthy Sex. I just want to let all the participants know that if they want to unmute their microphones, they can ask a question. And we're also going to uh, stay, keep the webinar going for a few more minutes uh, so Gabe has a chance to answer some questions if you guys want to stick around. Yeah, hey, can you hear and me I have okay? some questions here in the chat I'll go through. 
Yes, I can. Oh, yeah. Hey, Gabe, I love your work. I've been watching you and Gary and Noah for a year when I start, when I began stopping. Um, my, my question I have okay. to ask you is um, specifically, um, uh, and knowing your testimony and, and, and Noah's, do you see uh, how to set the expectations with some people like myself? I've been, you know, off it for a year, but I'm off of viewing pornography. But um, the, the tendency as a male, and I'm a 42 year old male, to correlate my uh, stopping viewing with my chances of an improved uh, girlfriend relationship. I just, I'm just asking, I guess, for what's your opinion? What, you, what would you give to that question? Because, you know, I tend to be sometimes maybe a little bit too rational in my approach that, um, you know, just because I quit this does not necessarily mean I'm going to have a buddy gets happy and my expectations get fulfilled. Right. So how do you respond? Right. To yeah. Well, uh, you, you got to definitely look at your, your lifestyle, what you've been doing uh, outside of just simply viewing porn. Um, and you can't, you know, think that just stopping porn is going to just magically cure everything in your life. Uh, I, I would say that you got to look at it broadly, vaguely, that you're going to get better at doing what you do. And so if that, if we apply that to socially and to talking with potential partners and getting out there and pursuing a relationship, if you just quit porn and you're just reading your brain on or if you're watching, uh, like you said, Noah's videos or my videos on YouTube, if all you're doing is getting educated and you're not going out there and getting real life experience, um, you're not going to go anywhere. Uh, you can read about learning how to shoot a basketball all day long, but if you don't go out there and actually shoot a basketball, you're not going to get better at shooting. Now, you might get a little bit better. There's actually some really cool interest, uh, interesting studies that show just thinking about something can help. But my point is, um, yeah, you do have to have a realistic uh, view of what recovery is going to look like. And if you haven't been uh, social um, and you haven't been pursuing conversations with potential partners and just working on that, Separately, uh, it's not going to be an end-all solution. But um, the good news is simply abstaining from porn will help you do that, have the motivation to do that, have the clarity of mind and confidence to start a conversation. Um, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, question for you? Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear. I have two people talking. Um, I'll start with the uh, lady that's speaking, and then I'll come back to the... Hi. Hi, I had written in a question. I have an 11-year-old grandson who I'm very close to, um, and he spends a lot of time, you know, on his computer doing uh, games and different things. How would I go about bringing up this topic in a way that I could assess whether or not it's in his reality or also educate and also educate him? I, that's a good question. I think at... That's such a tough age to have a, a, a conversation, but it is an important age, and there definitely needs to be a conversation. I think uh, for kids at that age, what I've seen to be successful, uh, I do a lot of mentoring with kids from the age of, let's say, 10 to 15. And one thing I encourage parents to do or anyone that knows a young person, uh, such as the age of 11, is to just bring up the topic in a, in a way that you're pointing them to what's healthy for them in their adult life. So if you're going to talk about uh, maybe forming a relationship when they're older or maybe being successful, uh, you can keep it vague. You can talk about the brain's reward circuit and how uh, you, I like to use the three examples of social media, video games, and pornography. If you have a young person that's addicted to social media or you think maybe not, obviously you don't know if they're addicted or not really, but uh, if you feel like they're spending too much time or focus on social media, you can talk to them about how doing that will affect their real life relationships and might affect their ability to have eye to eye contact and verbal skills when speaking with people in person. If you go to any uh, teenage function these days, they're all just glued to their phones. Um, and the more outgoing uh, teenagers that are uh, social and talkative, they practice those face-to-face -face skills. Um, so you could point that out to them and that point out the potential negative effects and not in a shaming way, but just that in a way that you want the best for them and do the same thing with video games. Uh, video games are fun. They're awesome. Uh, I still occasionally play with my friends. But there was a time where I had to realize that that was negatively impacting my drive for school, my drive for work. 
Um, and once I quit video games, I had more motivation to actually do a project at school or uh, maybe go to that interview for the job I wanted. Um, and then with porn, bring up pornography in a way that it will uh, hurt their real-life relationships or hurt their ability to have a healthy relationship, healthy intimacy with the real-life partner. So at that age, focus on the health benefits and avoid the shaming, avoid the this is wrong, um, because they'll listen to you if you do that. And then once you have their attention, then every parent, every person that has a loved one that's young, can uh, then you can go your um, – you know, however you want to personally cover the topic, whether that's with morals included or whatever. But I encourage everyone to bring up the health benefits first or the potential uh, negative effects. I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. I really appreciate it. Of course, it's everybody more, uh, here. Yeah. I, should I go? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks. Thank you so much for all the information question that I have is maybe two questions, but let's go quick. The uh, number one is the personal question. Um, I was exposed mm -hmm. to some magazines back in the 70s, you know, like when I was five years old, six years old, and um, and then I used to uh, do some masturbating over with magazines, you know, in my teens, and uh, and the uh, and some and some casual uh, sex and that was something that I stopped when I was 21 and uh, became more um, religiously inclined and so from then until the next 35 years I did nothing um, after marriage of many uh, you know over 20 years plus and uh, I then out of you know different emotional reasons, whatever, just decided to uh, finally open up my cell phone, which I had not done at all. I had no interest, no yeah. desire, yeah. no wanting. And I started to look for models and this and that, and it went from this. And then that, that, that curiosity, that desire for novelty, that, just, that was a huge, huge thing. And I played around with this for about a year, and... Um, and I never had erection, and I never masturbated. So it's a, uh, it was hard for me to, to know, am I really addicted or not? Um, I have joined SA, and I, um, mm -hmm. I've, I acknowledge that I'm powerless over lust, because if I would go back to this, I'm sure that that pool would come back. Um, and that draw, mm -hmm. that novelty, that novelty thing, is, is my kind of unusual story, does that, indicate any less of a reason for addiction or is that like that's that fits the bill well uh it's not a super common story as far as uh, if you have if you don't masturbate you just simply watch the videos but i have seen that in a lot of uh, a lot of cases uh my question for you on whether or not you're addicted or not uh were you able to abstain were you able to quit i know you mentioned you joined uh, or you started going to sa meetings um, addiction could be summed up real simply as the inability to quit. Uh, but if you're unable mm -hmm. to quit um, or if you find yourself craving porn instead of maybe a more healthy uh, just fantasy about someone that you know rather than turning to porn every time, um, if you're dependent on that or crave that, then that could be a sign of a problem for sure. Yeah, I, I don't even know if it was the porn. That it, was, it was just that that novelty and that hit and that mm -hmm. excitement and that, you know, that 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 was the uh that was, was it when you got a smartphone for the first time maybe <laughs> and you had access to no, it I, I i had it for for 20 years access to this stuff i never even okay. thought to look into it. and then um yeah, yeah I, so. I would suggest uh i would suggest to continue to go to a, a support group and dig into what might have uh, led you to to seek it out uh just because you said you had access to it for a long time and you never you never dove in and then eventually you did so my just advice real quick would be to find out uh, maybe why. Try and dig into that. I'm not saying you can, but at least dig into it. Maybe you'll find an answer. Maybe you won't. But also I'd encourage you to, to stay away and see if um, you go through withdrawal symptoms, see if you're able to, to stay away. And if you can't stay away, that's a good sign that there's a problem. Um, anyone yeah. else have a – Go ahead. Oh, Sorry, go ahead if you have a, the second part of that question. I know you said you had two. The, the – um... Yeah, so I, I was just 
as far as the essay, I mean, you didn't mention that I heard of much of it in terms of essay. I have found it very mm-hmm. helpful. Um, and the, yeah. uh, I wanted to know if that's something that you encourage in terms of recovery. Yeah. Uh, yes, it is. I, I encourage everyone to seek out a face-to-face support group if they're willing to. Um, obviously, you do have the online forms, but you're not going to get the benefits of that face-to-face uh, socialization with other people that can really help with anxiety, uh, knowing that there's real people sitting next to you that really care or that are just going through the same problem can be such a relief and weight off the shoulders. Um, I should also mention that some porn addicts might not relate to a lot of sex addicts in the sense that uh, I kind of started the talk today. I don't know if you were uh, listening at the very beginning, but sometimes sex addiction and porn um, porn addiction can look very different. And I've seen guys say that they don't relate when they go to SA meetings. Um, If that's the case, I'd uh, encourage you to seek out a a specific porn addiction group. Um, But if you can't find a face-to-face group, there's Reboot Nation, my site, and there's other forums where you can uh, share, ask questions, get support. But definitely I encourage going to a group. And the the fact that I had no problem whatsoever, even in my 50s, that the – to be able to have erectile functionality and – feeling of intimacy and closeness and and focus on my wife. I wasn't thinking about these other ladies. I was, I had, you know, erections perfectly normal with my wife. Um, Maybe a little bit, you know, you know, more, it was maybe a little more arousal, but it wasn't anything that was like, I would not force Mm -hmm. her to do anything or, you know, to do anything crazy. So the, um, so that I was just, it's just been baffling to me. Yeah. We'll continue to uh to investigate it. This is a journey that everyone has to uh to go on if you think you you have been influenced or have a problem. So uh I hope the best for you. Uh, I hope what my answer or my help uh or my advice was helpful. Um and feel free to contact me further if you want. You can message me on Reboot Nation or 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 tweet at me or um get at me on the forum. I'd love tweet. to continue to help. <laughs> okay. That would really be great. All right, we have another uh Continue We have another question. Thanks for your question. And I hope the best for you. Uh we have a a, a commenter AA. She says, "Hi, thanks for this great info. I also have a question. As a single girl, trying to find a guy without a porn problem is hard. How can I approach the topic with a guy who has a uh, who has um voiced this without making him Okay, a guy who has voiced this without making him anxious." And how long should he be clean to be ready for a relationship? Um, Well, everyone's different. Let me start by saying that. I think uh, real life uh, intimacy and connection can start um, as soon as both people in the relationship are ready. Uh, When you're going through the rebooting process, the rewiring process, um, to put it simply, when you're developing pathways for a real person rather than porn, that can start as soon as both people Please enter your uh, password. The then press pound. Are, are happy with it. Um, so I encourage you to do that as soon as he's ready. Uh, and in terms of Please enter your password. Your then press pound. Or getting him to uh, to dial into your desires and wants and you know him wanting to recover, I would just again tell him you're there for him, uh, tell him that you love him and um, let him know that he can talk to you about anything. If a guy knows that nothing's off limits and he can be open and honest with you. Maybe let him know that you've read up about the topic and you know the uh, situations that can arise from pornography and the negative effects. If he knows you kind of understand that and have a uh, glimpse into the uh, ugliness, if you will, of the situation, he'll might, he might be more um, open to uh, recovering with you and going through that process and also just being open in his communication with you. I hope that is helpful. I'm reading through the comments right now, and I'm not sure if uh, if y'all can hear me. Charlie, are you able to hear me right now? Yes. Okay, I'll uh, I'll wait just one more one more minute to see if anyone else has any other questions. There's a question here from. Um, Mary I have a Allen. question right I don't here. Know if she has, uh, okay, I'll. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, but I'll read uh, Cherry Allen's right here. Yeah. Okay, great. Go for it. Yeah, she said, uh, 
wondering if science has shown any chemical differences in the brain between male and female porn addicts. Um, she says she's a 45-year-old woman wondering. Um, well, there's, there hasn't been any studies specifically on female brains while they're viewing porn. Uh, there's been studies that included females. Um, and what we know is there's some differences, but as far as the addiction-related brain changes go, there is not. Uh, we, have, uh, we have women on Reboot Nation that are addicted to porn and going through recovery. We have women that have developed uh, porn-induced sexual dysfunctions where it's difficult to stay aroused or difficult to climax with their partner. Um, but as far as research in regards to females in porn, it, it's, it's definitely lacking. Um, so the answer to that would be no. I hope that is helpful. But we do know that uh, what we do know is uh, anecdotally in watching recovery that it, uh, it, it all works out in the end the same for both males and females. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, hey, um, wondering, so um, is this a situation where, um, like alcoholism, where it's either all or nothing, or does, can anybody ever get to a point where they can actually watch it if they choose to and just uh, leave it alone? Or is it something that you really just basically, once you're addicted, you basically have to stay away from it uh, altogether? Yeah, the, the whole once an addict, always an addict. Uh, to answer that, um, it, it's definitely the same uh, as far as once you develop an addiction, those neurological pathways might always be there for the rest of your life. Uh, they just might be dormant and not activated. Um, you can get to a place, uh, like I'll use myself as an example. I no longer feel cravings for porn. I no longer will see a sexual image and be triggered to go watch porn. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't every now and then feel those uh, dormant sensitized pathways come back to life, if you will. For example, I was watching a documentary uh, that, that showed a lot of uh, triggering material, uh, basically porn scenes that were somewhat blurred out. And some of it was the stuff that I used to watch. And uh, I felt my body becoming aroused, even though I didn't want to. Um, and that was really uh, telling to me because it had been at that point three years since I watched porn. Um, and so my advice to guys is if you've reached a point where you were addicted or you developed a dysfunction to stay away for good, because I'm not going to say you can't occasionally watch porn and then you're, you're going to instantly develop an addiction or erectile dysfunction again. Uh, that's not always the case, but it's such a slippery slope. We've seen so many guys go back to, you know, they try and justify one video here or there a month or try and have a schedule of when they're going to watch porn. And it, from what we've seen, it's just like alcoholism, like you said, to where it's a slippery slope. And once that uh, once that's formed in your brain, it's going to be difficult to ignore if you go back to it. I hope that helps. Yes, it does. Thank you. All right. Well, I think that's all the time we have for today. Um, so I want to thank Gabe for coming and giving, us, uh, giving this talk. Uh, like Gabe said, you can contact him through RebootNation.org or on Twitter at Gabe Deem. Uh, and I want to thank all of our audience members for participating. That was a really great discussion. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to say thanks to everyone that tuned in. And again, thanks for uh, Center of Healthy Sex for having me. I hope some of this was helpful to you all. And feel free to, to hit me up.